Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is June 6, 2019, and I could not be more excited uh, to have with us today another epic, amazing, phenomenal author and guest. Uh, those of you who are followers of Mormon Stories Podcast will remember a few epic interviews that we've had over the past uh, couple of years with, with never Mormons. We call them never Mo's in our community. One is Tova Mirvis, who wrote that amazing book, The Book of Separation, about being an Orthodox Jew, losing your faith, being in a mixed faith marriage, leaving your husband. Uh, that was an amazing uh, book. We brought her to Salt Lake City. We also had the privilege of interviewing Tara Westover about her amazing book, Educated, uh, brought her to Salt Lake City as well. And now uh, we have the chance to interview um, Amber Scora about her brand new book, Hot Off the Press leaving the witness, uh, exiting a religion and finding a life. We interviewed uh, Lloyd Evans a couple weeks ago about his Jehovah's Witness uh, experience, but uh, Amber's book uh, is going to take our understanding of the Jehovah's Witness movement to a new level. Um, so we're thrilled to have her today. We're thrilled to have several, many, many people joining us live on Facebook. And so without any further ado, Amber Scora, welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thanks, John. I'm really happy to be here. We had a false start, so thanks for your patience. <laughs> happy to be here again. <laughs> All right, so many of our listeners will have had a bit of an introduction uh, to the Jehovah's Witness movement through Lloyd Evans. Do you know Lloyd? Uh, yeah, we've talked online. I've met him in person once when he came to New York, yeah. Super cool. Well, every experience is different, and there's so much that your book adds. Um, we're just thrilled to have you. So thanks for joining us. and. Where do you want to begin with your story? There's so much to talk about in so such a little time. Yeah, um, I was just uh, thinking how the one thing that really overlaps that might be interesting to Mormons or ex-Mormons is that my story involves a mission in China. Um, and I, you know, it's funny because when I was in China, I do remember seeing other Mormons there, especially in Taiwan. I think in Taiwan it was a little more obvious because you didn't have to be as secretive in Taiwan. Uh, and in the book, it's funny because there is this scene where I talk about how sometimes the people we talked to would mistake us for Mormons. Funnily and enough. I loved, and I loved it that the last thing you guys wanted to be identified as is, was Mormons. <laughs> we're like, no, 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 no. Those, Mormon, those Mormons are the ones who, when they ride their bicycles, wear helmets. We don't wear helmets. They called them <laughs> helmet preachers in Taiwan, which is funny, which was dumb not to wear a helmet. It's not a PSA or anything saying don't wear helmets. Yeah, and I loved it. And I've got a everybody does when they're on a bicycle, so it was unusual. Totally. I've got a I've got a friend of the family who served a Mormon mission in Taiwan. And so I told him, you gotta read this book just because it talks yeah. about being a a missionary in Taiwan. But let's go back just a tiny bit, Amber. Yeah. Tell us about your your parents and your upbringing just briefly in the Jehovah's Witness movement. How did your parents or in this case, I think your grandparents kind of get into the movement? Yeah, I'm third generation Jehovah's Witness, or I was, um, and my grandparents on both sides converted, and probably much like Mormons, there's not a lot of intermarry, like there's not a lot of external marrying. Most, when you're a Jehovah's Witness, you're pretty much supposed to marry another Jehovah's Witness, so that's how it sort of came down the family line. My grandparents, um, I, I'm from Canada, and they were, um, they, they studied as adults and converted and got baptized. So my mom, um, she was raised in it as of the age of around 14. Um, on my dad's side, I think he started a little, I think his parents converted a little earlier. But by the time my parents had me, they had become inactive in the faith. Do you know why? I don't really know why. And my parents, t it's strange, but they didn't really tell me a lot of things. Um, but basically, I, I can sort of imagine the reasons. Um, I'm not sure how many meetings a week Mormons have, but Joe's Witnesses at that time had three meetings a week, technically five, but two of them were on the same day, um, preaching all the time. And there's a lot of pressure to be um, perform as a witness. Like if you don't preach and if, you don't, if you're not regular at the meetings, you'll start to get elders visits. So I can imagine, you know, my parents, whatever the reason, um, they had two little kids by that point, they just stopped going for a while. However, they still took us to the main meetings, like the biggest meetings of the years, like the memorial we call it, is sort of like, feels like if you're Jehovah's Witness and you don't go to the memorial, which is like basically the anniversary of Jesus' death, 
then you know you're de definitely going to die in Armageddon. However, um, most of the meetings we didn't go to. However, as a child, I don't know. I think I was a very introspective child. Maybe I don't know, but. I would listen at these few meetings we did go to and hear what they were saying. And it really had an impact on me. I started to have a lot of fear and like worry that if my family didn't go start going back to the kingdom hall, that we would all be destroyed because Jehovah's Witnesses at their meetings, like every meeting they talk about how Armageddon is going to happen like at any moment. And they, they've been talking that way for a hundred years, but when you're a child and that's your first introduction to it, it has a big, effect on you. Tell us, since we're there, I know this is really hard, but in a few minutes, and your, and your book has a chapter on this or two, give us just an overview of the main, you know, doctrinal or theological tenets of the Jehovah's Witness movement, so we can frame sure. that as we talk about your upbringing and your story. Yeah, so they were founded in the late 1800s, and they kind of came out of that um, Second Great Awakening in the Eastern United States, where like Seventh Day Adventists came, I think maybe Mormons. Uh, don't, for, don't forget Mormons. <laughs> <laughs> at the same time, yes. Um, and they sort of, you know, morphed and managed to be one of those religions, sex, sex really, at the time that evolved into a sort of this larger mainstream proselytizing religion. Um, their core beliefs are basically they feel that they are the only true Christian religion on earth today, that they're basically an extension of first century Christianity. The only, the only sort of like continuous line from Jesus followers to the present day. Um, there was a governing body that was in Brooklyn for a hundred years and just recently moved to upstate New York. And the governing body is this group of, I think, eight men who write a lot of the literature, make a lot of the doctrinal decisions, um, and basically run the show. Um, from the very beginning, they were very apocalyptic. They, they believed in Armageddon, that the world was going to end. We were living in the last days as of 1914, which is a date that they picked out calculating using sort of like mysterious calculations from the book of Daniel, I think it is. And um, wasn't there temple kind of Egyptian numerology stuff? In yeah, there? like going further back, what a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses don't know is that Charles T. Russell, Russell, the original founder, when he was really on his search for truth, he even traveled to the pyramids in Egypt and was looking for answers there. Basically, you know, when, when people have this preset idea that the world's ending, they're looking for some formula that can co confirm that that's going to happen. And that's, I think, what he was doing. So eventually he found through this, you know, math in the scriptures, um, a way to pinpoint 1914 as the beginning of the last days. Originally, they thought that was going to be Armageddon. But when Armageddon didn't come, they, they realized, oh, no, no, it's just the last days. So over the you know, ensuing 100 years, they've just over and over predicted, they used to pick dates up to 1975. And then when finally in 1975, when Armageddon didn't come, they kind of stopped doing that because they realized that a lot of people left when it didn't happen. So now they just talk about how that Armageddon is imminent. Um, some t like sort of notable things about witnesses that most people know is their preaching, of course, and that preaching is informed by the idea that they think the world is going to end and that makes them as zealous as they are. Um, also, they don't celebrate birthdays, Christmas. Um, funnily enough, because most people think of that as a really Christian holiday, they don't celebrate it because of the pagan roots. So they basically, essentially, they take a very literal translation of the Bible and they, they view themselves as sort of a pure Christianity that hasn't been adulterated by these sort of other pagan traditions that most, they say, most other churches have. And do you have a sense, and we'll get into this, but how, how is it different from just Presbyterianism, Lutheranism? Have you thought about ways, key ways that it kind of is set apart from mainstream Protestant yeah. Christianity? I mean, I don't know if I would call those religions fundamentalist, but Jehovah's Witnesses are definitely fundamentalist religion. Um, they're what? different in the sense, sorry? Meaning what? Just that they, I actually was like studying this in religious religion class just this semester. And I'm trying to like define <laughs> the definition, but I think it's basically like a religion that adheres to a doctrine and it's like the pure faith and right. also doesn't have a lot of evolution in their teachings. Right. So for example, the Jehovah's Witnesses have one of the main things to know about Jehovah's Witnesses too is that they don't believe in taking blood, blood transfusions. Right. And that's sort of what I would consider a really fundamentalist doctrine in the sense that 
they don't revise. Someone, you know, I, I think it was the 50s, they decided that. And no matter how much evidence is produced that, you know, perhaps we should, you know, evolve the church, reform the church, they don't. They are like, what was proclaimed then is the truth and we can't change it no matter what happens. Right. Similar with their policy on reporting child abuse, which we can get into later. So there's that. Um, doctrinally, they're different than other churches in that they don't believe in the Trinity. The Trinity is almost a feature universally of Christian churches, and the Josephs believe that there's God, Jehovah, Jesus as the intermediary between God and man and the Savior. <clears throat> that's, that's quite different. Um, they also pride themselves on being preachers because most of those Christian churches don't actually fulfill that command of Jesus to go and preach the good news in the entire inhabited earth. And that's something that Jehovah's Witnesses often use to point to themselves as evidence of being the true religion. They're also neutral. They don't get involved in politics. Jehovah's Witnesses don't vote. And they all, this comes from the scripture they pull out where Jesus said that we shouldn't get involved in the affairs of the world and we should be you know, separate from the world. Right. Um, okay, so uh, towards the end of your book, you talk after leaving you talk about all the things you were able to do for the first time i think you mentioned eating lucky charms was it uh you, you know you oh, mentioned yeah. seeing our movies for the first time yeah. like behaviorally what are the things that jehovah's witnesses aren't aren't generally allowed to do what are the things that are frowned upon well it's funny because um that thing about the lucky charms or like smurfs there was a big thing about smurfs in the right. 80s that people thought smurfs suddenly were demonized some of these things don't come necessarily from the leaders but you know how like you've got this culture a sort of an insular culture and i don't know if this happens with the mormons but like some of these things will sort of arise that are just kind of quirky and weird too like totally uh, like so mormons mormons for the longest time wouldn't drink coca-cola um because it had caffeine because coffee and tea were forbidden right yeah, yeah. so like lucky charms was to do with um the fact that luck was satanic so anything that was related to the occult you know, psychics, all of these things are satanic. So anything that is considered satanic is you can't participate in. So as a child, like there's some things we're allowed to do. As you say, we could watch some movies, but not R-rated movies. I could watch cartoons when I was a kid, but we weren't allowed to watch Scooby-Doo because there was ghosts in it. It's this type of thing. Okay. And what um, about like purity, morality? You know, you talked about wearing a mini skirt at the end. Yeah. <laughs> and how, what about morality, purity, modesty, that sort of thing? Oh, yeah, stuff. modesty. Um, dress, modesty and dress is very important. You can't, even as a woman, you're not supposed to cut your hair short because you might look like a man. Um, one thing I always find interesting now having left is that a lot of the parameters for what is considered modest seem to align with the era that the governing body members, they're all older men, mainly white men, um, it's sort of like the 1950s era version of modesty is the Jehovah's Witness so-called biblical era of modesty. For example, I just heard of someone who, you know, so many men these days have a trimmed beard. I, I know someone who was uh, basically removed as an elder, which is like the, a leader in the congregation because he had a trimmed beard, which really made me laugh because in all the publications, when they depict Jesus, he has a beard. Yeah. We got the same thing. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's silly. I mean, and nowadays, no one thinks a beard is like bad or like sort of spooky. But I think in the 50s, it was like if you had a beard that was kind of like anti-establishment or something. <laughs> yeah, you, you will die when you learn all the parallels between Mormonism and the Jewish. I'm actually very interested. And that's yeah. funny how these parallels independently sprouted up. Yeah, Brigham yeah. Young University is named after Brigham Young. He had a beard. You can't have a beard at BYU. <laughs> I always think that every man looks 33% more handsome when he has a trimmed beard. It's a shame. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, and then of course, we'll talk about the shunning and, and Lloyd talked about that. Basically, don't have non Jehovah's Witnesses as friends. And yeah. if somebody breaks some of the big rules, you're to cut them off, right? Yeah. There's a, shunning is a big thing. Um, definitely similar to Mormonism, I think. I think it's worse. I actually think you guys win the prize on shunning. Yeah. Um, but we have soft shunning. You guys kind of have hard, hard shunning. Yeah. But we've got our other things. Okay. Um, all right. So let's talk about now your upbringing. So what was it like? What was your home like? How would you characterize kind of your, your parents, their parenting style, and what sort of uh, home life you had as you were approaching teenagerhood? 
Oh, well, it's interesting because my parents were inactive. They, they were not active in the church, but they still taught us that we were Jehovah's Witnesses. And you know, when you're a child, you don't know any different. So um, early on, I thought I was a Jehovah's Witness. So when I was at school, I had to, there's a lot of stands you have to make as a child. It's really, it's really intimidating and difficult. But for example, um, if someone was having a birthday and they had cake, we weren't allowed to participate. We couldn't have the cake. We couldn't sing happy birthday. At Christmas time, and they were singing Christmas carols in the gym, we'd have to go outside. When they sang the national anthem, we'd have to sit down when everyone was standing up. Um, so I was adhering to all these things, and you know, I, but I didn't have any Jehovah's Witness friends. I only had friends at school because we didn't go to the Kingdom Hall. So it was a weird thing where, in a sense, I kind of had the worst of both worlds because I didn't really have fit in at school, but I also didn't have the community of the church. Um, so uh, it was a little weird. I think that's why I'm a little weird to this day, maybe. Like, I can spend a lot of time alone and be fine. Um, but uh, eventually, I heard enough at the church that my fear grew, and I asked my parents if they could take us back to the meetings. So when that happened, then I finally realized what it meant to be a Jehovah's Witness, and it's, it was a very busy life. It meant you know, Saturday mornings, you didn't get to watch cartoons anymore. You had to go out preaching, sometimes on Sundays, too. Sunday, we had a meeting. Uh, we had a meeting on Tuesday night and Thursday night. And in between those meetings, we had to do a lot of preparation for the meetings, which involved looking at the Watchtower magazines, underlining the answers, looking up the scriptures that they were quoting in the articles. Um, as I got a little older and I started to have a lot of friends in the congregation moving on to teenage years, it was, it was fun. Like we, because you're in a community and you have this thing in common, there's other kids your age, we had a real bond and we, we did a lot of fun stuff together. It wasn't like life wasn't fun, but of course we did have our boundaries. As you say, we didn't go to R rated movies and as far as like dating, things like that were pretty forbidden. Um, and as we got older. So you weren't allowed to date as teens or you weren't supposed to? You're not supposed to. You're only supposed to date when you're with a view to marriage. So. Funnily enough, most chosen says, I don't know about Mormons, but get married at like 18 years old because you can't have sex <laughs> before marriage. So Yeah, that's us. <laughs> yeah. So dating with a view to marriage would be like, I guess you'd start dating at age 17 and a half and get married by 18. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I was a bit different that I kind of, I didn't rebel, but I ended up, when I did start, I started dating a guy, seeing a guy, if you can call it that, when you're just a bunch of teenagers hanging out together. Um, and he was a bit older than me. And then we ended up kind of having a relationship and um, ended up when I was 18, getting disfellowshipped because we committed immorality. That was Thomas, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you had, you, 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 Thomas became kind of your boyfriend and you had, you had sex, but it wasn't just sex. It was, I, as I read that part of the book, I'm like, what a beautiful time of like, connection of intimacy so of exploring great. the world what's that it was so great yeah i was like i everyone should have that little period <laughs> in their life where they're just young and adults and in love and yeah. exploring the world right and i think because we got disfellowshipped or you know kicked out of the church i mean i was i was still a true believer but of course my you know mortal or carnal sins you know i had like brought me to the outside. And I knew I was always gonna come back in because I was fully indoctrinated. But all the same, it was such a magical time. And then I think because we were so on our own, having been shunned by everyone we knew, and we didn't have friends in the outside world, like why would we do that? Um, it was this sort of little romantic, uh, sort of couple of years where we just did everything together and um, like explored the world and um, like explored ourselves and understood, started to understand things it was like a rum. It was like a rum springer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Except I, I didn't want it to end. I'm reading that part, and I'm like, no, don't, don't leave, don't leave. What, what kept you? And you've already said it, but what kept you from just staying there? You know, in that moment of joy and freedom, what were the hooks that brought you back? Well, for me, and I don't. I think it's different for everyone why they stay in a religion like this, even when you are raised in it. But the big, like, sticky thing for me was the fear. 
from right when I was a kid, just this idea of dying. I, I love being alive. I love life. And I was really afraid still, even though Armageddon hadn't come so many times that it was supposed to, I still was just afraid of dying at Armageddon. I didn't want to, I didn't want to be killed. That was the one number one thing for me. And I did really believe in Jehovah. I still prayed. I was, I, 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 I thought that it was the truth and I wanted to, I wanted to live forever. Basically, that was a big thing for me. So tell us how that, that early church discipline worked uh, and, and how the shunning or, or disfellowshipment uh, was for you. And then what in the world uh, allowed you to endure that and then return? Um, I think at the beginning it was all good because we were having a great time. But then the pressure started to mount because we both wanted to come back. And let me put as an aside here, if there had been in that day and age such accessible information as there is now on the internet about how, like what your church is about, uh, like other people you could talk to that had been in the church and left. But in that era, it was, there was nothing. Like, how would I find anything out about my my beliefs? I would what, go to the library. There was nothing. It was, there was nothing available. So I think that, there was a, this sort of chance that I, I almost dodged the bullet and got out, but then there was just, my, my mind was too indoctrinated to, to leave. Um, so yeah, as time went on, the pressure re- mounted that we either had to stop having sex um, by either just being suddenly celibate with each other, which is a really hard thing to do when you're that age and you already had sex. Yeah, super <laughs> So hard. the other answer was to get married. That's really was the only answer, get married or completely break up. And why didn't you, you and Thomas get married? I, I would have done it, but Thomas was an interesting Jehovah's Witness. He, he was more of a bit of a free thinker, which I lo- was really some latent thing in me was really attracted to, obviously. Um, but he had come from a family with, you know, parents who had married young and not had a good marriage. And he had older sisters and younger sisters who got married very young and didn't have good marriages. And he was just like, I'm not going to do it. He's like, I don't want to get married. We were still, I was 18. He was a little older. He was 23, but I mean, he was just like, it's a mistake. It's a mistake. And I mean, looking back now, I, I think it's, it was such a love story that it's sad that it didn't work out. But of course, I don't think it's, it's a real crapshoot to get married at that age and have it work yeah. out. Do you know where Thomas is now? Is he still a Jehovah's yeah, Witness? Yeah, I know where he is, yeah. Is he still a Jehovah's Witness? No. Okay, cool. Left, but it's a long story, which I could tell. Thomas, Thomas, you're next on Mormon Stories Podcast. Yeah. Okay, so you were disfellowshipped, right? Um, yeah, at that time? Or, yeah. 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 So what was that like, meeting with the elders, being judged by men, just talk to, I was excommunicated. A lot of yeah. Mormons have been going through excommunication lately. Just talk to us about what it was like to be a 18, 19 year old woman being grilled about sexual matters by a bunch of middle-aged men. What was that like? Yeah, that was, it was, it was odd. Um, I had, it's always a panel of three elders that you meet with. And interestingly, a lot of people ask me, why did you tell them? Like, why do Jehovah's Witnesses tell the elders? I'm like, of course we tell them because we're taught we, to police ourselves. And we knew if we hid something, we're going to get killed at Armageddon anyways, so we better tell them. So yeah, I, you know, you contact a brother and tell them like, look, I I need to talk to you. You tell them brief notes about what it's, what it is. And then they form a judicial committee, they call it. So you attend the judicial committee at the kingdom hall usually, and they sit you down and they say, okay, so tell us what happened. So, you know, I mean, I was really young and these men they weren't super old, the ones on my panel, which in some ways made it kind of weirder because funnily enough, one of the brothers who were on, was on that judicial committee is now also no longer Jehovah's Witness, which is crazy. But yeah, they'd ask me all the details and there's certain things they're very interested in is like, was it premeditated or did it just happen? Which is a bit of a weird question when it comes to sex. Um, (laughs) They wanna know sort of like if you enjoyed it. (laughs) Um, They definitely wanna know whether the man climaxed um you can say it <laughs> they uh they yeah they want to know how many times it occurred because that's a way that they judge whether you're a you climaxed was that did they care if you climaxed no they did not <laughs> of course <laughs> of course not <laughs> um and so yeah there was all of that and then um finally interestingly i've always been treated and some people have been treated terribly in these judicial committees it all depends on the elders you get. And I've always kind of been lucky that way that I've had pretty 
reasonable elders that I've confessed to. And these elders, I think because my boyfriend was five years older than me, they really were kind of taking it easy on me. They were like, you know, we sort of hold him more responsible. And they said to me basically like, sort of feeling me out, but they were like, you know, if you're repentant enough, you don't have to get disfellowshipped. And I, I was so in love and having such a great time that I told them, honestly, I was like, you better just disfellowship me because I can't, I won't be able to stop. <laughs> So yeah, I kind of disfellowshipped myself in the end, but I knew that if I didn't, it would just be, I'd have to come back and tell them the next time I had sex. I, I just knew I wasn't in a place that I was going to be able to just reform immediately. And that meant shunning, right? And that meant shunning, yeah. So how I was you shunned. shunned in that first, that first era? So how, how long? How long, yeah. Uh, it, it was a couple years, at least. Okay, so you were cut off yeah. from your entire family. Did, did your parents honor that shunning since they were kind of inactive? My parents were active by this time because when I was a kid, remember I had asked them to go back. I don't know if I made that clear. And my whole family did go back around the time I was 12. You probably did. I may have missed it. That's okay. Um, so it's a strange story, but Jehovah's Witnesses, this is another thing we can get into. Unlike Mormons, unfortunately, um, Jehovah's Witnesses don't go to college. We're not allowed to go to college. So at 18, I had already moved out of home and moved to the city. So I was already living in my own apartment, which was crazy. And I had a job. So my, my parents, my, my mom didn't talk to me. My dad at the same time was in a severe alcoholic episode. Uh, and so he did come and see me and talk to me, but it was obviously that was sort of its own set of problems. My family did have some problems such as alcoholism, dysfunction. So um, yeah, it was, you know, it was shunning. My sister shunned me, definitely. My brother was much younger, so it wasn't as relevant. But um, yeah, my family shunned me, and same with his family. And that was har harder for him than for me, I think, because his family was quite close. For someone who doesn't understand the psychological impact of being shunned, um, can, you, can you just briefly say anything about what that's like? Well, it's Emotion strange. Emotionally? I think it's a really... I mean, it's, it's basically emotional blackmail because they shun you because they say it's an act of love, that if they shun you, you will come to your senses and the only way you'll come back to the faith and not be killed in Armageddon is if you come, you sort of like, get the, the pain of shunning gets strong enough that it, it compels you to return to the faith, stop sinning, this type of thing. So for me, um, so it's a little humiliating. I mean, your name gets announced from the platform in front of the whole congregation as being disfellowshipped. And when that happens, everyone knows immediately not to speak to you. And then what happens after that is that if you want to get reinstated or allowed back in, you have to attend all the meetings in the back row. You sit at the back. You have to come and right at the end so no one has to see you yeah. and leave right as it ends, right at the beginning, sorry. Come right at the beginning, yeah. right, but not too early and then leave right as, so no one has to see you, right? Exactly, so you're not, no one's tempted to talk to you or whatever. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it feels like a little bit of a penance for sure. <laughs> you know, you're sort of contritely sitting in the back row and leaving uh, afterwards. And the thing is though, as you know, when you're raised with it, I was like, well, no, this is what I deserve. I mean, I had sex and I'm not stopping, so I deserve to be the one sitting back here, ostracized by everyone. Uh, so I just dealt with it. And the weird thing was, is that you would think that a person who was shunned and then was out in the world at least would have gone out at my age and made friends and at least been able to go have some fun. But I didn't. I just, I, I wasn't familiar with the world. I didn't really understand how the world worked and I was afraid of it. So I basically just spent a lot of time alone. And there were periods during the shunning where Thomas and I would break up because we were trying to stop. And so there were times where I was very alone, where I would just spend the entire weekend when I wasn't at work by myself to the point where I, I lost my voice because I hadn't talked to anyone in so long. Um, so it was, definitely, it was definitely painful and weird. But to me, it was sort of like, well, I made my bed and just, I just kept trying to find the way to get back. I have I have a psychology PhD, so I sometimes do these coaching moments, and I just want to add a couple things. Yeah. I heard Julie Diazovedo Hanks one time say that um, that solitary confinement is a universal form of torture, and yeah. basically what she's getting at there is that uh, is that uh, shunning or things like it 
is is literally a form of torture. And then there's always Caitlin Ryan's research uh, about the LGBT community that um, the the largest contributor to LGBTQ LGBTQ suicide is family rejection. Yeah, um, and it's going to be true for non LGBTQ people as well. Family rejection is one of the most severe psychological punishments you can ever uh, give somebody and it's brutal and I just yeah. I had to give that a spotlight. I think it's really important to understand because some people don't really understand how the effect it can have on people and also it depends I think on like the, the person themselves like how marginalized they feel. I mean I still did kind of have Thomas more like more or less through that whole period but for example you mentioned the LGBTQ there was um, I mentioned in the book that there was a brother who got disfellowshipped later when I was reinstated for being gay. And during the time he was disfellowshipped- It was Dale, right? Yeah, he hung himself in the forest of the territory where we would preach looking to save lives. Meanwhile, shunning this person that we knew who was so alone that he killed himself. And so, I, was, I was so, you know, I wrote this down. I took like eight pages of notes from your book, but he, he hung himself in the forest because without his Jehovah's Witness religious friends, no one would have discovered him in his home yeah. because he didn't have any friends outside of the Jehovah's Witness community. So he hung himself in a forest so that he would be found. I know, it's like, gives me tingles to this day because it's so tragic. Yeah. And of course well, I even feel this responsibility now that I'm not indoctrinated anymore where I feel ashamed of myself. Like, how could I do that to somebody? Um, but I did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when we know better, we do better, uh, yeah. as Oprah likes to say. Um, yeah. And uh, Mormons have their own suicide epidemic going on in Utah oh, uh, really? with the LGBT youth and adults. Uh, and kids who masturbate, like it's, it's really brutal. So back to your story. Um, so you endured the shunning and then what happened? So eventually, Thomas and I managed to fully break up, and then there was enough period of time where I hadn't committed immorality that I could write a letter to the elders and ask to meet with them. So then you meet with them, and they basically talk to you, find out, kind of grill you to find out when the last time you committed sin was, and if they, they meet amongst themselves and they decide whether you can be reinstated. I think that I might have tried once, and they said, no, you have to wait longer because I hadn't waited, it had been too soon since my last episode. <laughs> um, but eventually I was reinstated. And it's crazy because the day they announced it, same thing from the platform that Amber Scora has been reinstated. It's just like a light switch. Everyone's so loving, comes back, like it invites, right away the next weekend I was invited to a cabin and the contrast between being on the outside and the inside. I mean, it did make you feel like this organization is a wonderful place when you're indoctrinated. You're not thinking like, wait a minute, why was I out there? <laughs> um, but it does make you feel when you're back in it that the light is just shining on you and the, the warmth and the love. There's definitely, I am not saying here that there's not nice people in Jehovah's Witnesses because there's wonderful people. I love the people. The problem is the indoctrination. Yeah, yeah. So how soon after being reinstated did you end up getting married to uh, the person that was your first husband? It wasn't long. It was definitely not long enough um, that I waited. But all of my friends were already married. By this point, I was, you know, 21 when I got reinstated. So I think I met him. It was probably, it was within a year, maybe a year after I got reinstated, I think, after a year. And ago. his name in the book is? <laughs> no, no I, didn't, I didn't use his name. Okay. It's a yeah, funny thing because I just, I knew how badly he did, he would not want to be in the book. And also the relationship wasn't, it wasn't a super significant relationship for me, which is so sad because it was my marriage. But <laughs> there was something where I think it was just, to me, it wasn't a book about my marriage. It was a book about leaving my religion and my marriage. So yeah, and, and, it just and, came out that way that I didn't use his name. The thing that I, the thing that I say, I mean, that's kind of symbolic um, yeah. But the thing I like to say in Mormonism is in Orthodox Mormonism, we don't marry each other. We marry the church. And so it kind of doesn't, in some sense, it almost doesn't matter who you marry because it's That's just about thing. living the, you know, getting on the train and going with the train. And you can yeah. pretty much do that with anybody. If you both have heartbeats and a, 
some sort of libido and the same goals, it kind of doesn't matter who you marry. It's very yeah. impersonal. And in the book, your marriage had a sense of just feeling very impersonal. Oh, it's so funny. It's really nice that you understand that because I think a lot of people don't understand that. Well, we both come from similar backgrounds, Amber. <laughs> okay, so what made you go to freaking China to be a missionary when you were kind of this prodigal daughter that was coming from an inactive home? Like, that's hardcore, right? Yeah, well, it's weird. I think. I think it's a bit of my personality and maybe because the religion wasn't forced on me the way that for some people it was, it felt like something I had chosen. And because I believed it so fully and my fear was so strong of leaving it or it not being true, I just went to the furthest degree I could as a woman in the church, which was first to start what we called pioneering, which is when you live you know, in your home congregation, you're putting in 70 hours a month in preaching. And all of us have to support ourselves. So we work, I work part time and I started doing that pioneering work after I got married. Um, and then what happened was during that pioneer work, you know, the more you go out preaching or out in service, as we call it, the more you find it's a complete waste of time. You're spending 70 hours a month, basically hardly ever talking to anyone. You're just driving around in cars, visiting houses where no one's home. Nobody, if they are home, they're not interested. They're like, why are you here? So after a number of years of that, I started to get interested in preaching to immigrants in my territory, most of whom, because I live near a university, were Chinese from mainland China. And my response in that community when I would preach was much better because a lot of them told me in the end, it was because they wanted to practice English. At the time, I couldn't obviously speak Mandarin. Uh, and so Chinese people would study the Bible with you, whereas the average person wouldn't. So I started to just try and learn Chinese to teach people. And that kind of brought me to my interest to eventually going to China. And uh, so you and your first husband go to China. Which city? Shanghai, right? Shanghai, yeah. So first we went to Taiwan to make our Chinese better, which took three years because it's a hard language to learn. You can't learn it unless you're in the environment, is my opinion. So after three years, it was me that was really pushing to go to China. I was really into it. I wanted to... I had been there on a visit once. I loved this idea of going to this territory where no one had been reached before. So I, I kept begging my husband to write a letter to the branch in Hong Kong who looked after China at the time and seeing if we could go. Like telling them, look, we've been pioneers for this long. We can speak Chinese. They didn't let everyone go. You had to sort of, you know, prove that you were kind of Earn it. at a certain level of spirituality that you could handle it, which clearly I couldn't. <laughs> And so total number of years in China, either Taiwan or mainland as a missionary? Yeah, it was three in Taiwan and then three in Shanghai, yeah. See, Mormons only go for two years. So you, you yeah. outdid us. You, you tripled um, the Mormon experience. That's pretty hardcore. Yeah. But let's not forget that after two years in China, I left the religion. <laughs> oh, right. Okay, so, so let's, uh, let's talk just briefly about what that's like. How, like as Mormons, you, you're full-time missionaries, you don't have jobs, you don't go, you go with single people when you're 18 or 19. Yeah. Tell us just really briefly kind of how you exist as a missionary, Jehovah's Witness missionary in a place like China. How do you, how do you make that work, especially when you're married? Yeah, so in Jehovah's Witnesses, there are missionaries who are sent by the church, a very small number, and they're funded. But in my book, I mentioned it's called pioneering, but I just use the word missionary because most people understand that terminology better. So for people who were pioneers like us, we were sort of missionaries, but we were on our own volition coming. So we had to find a way to get a work visa uh, as a sort of disguise even for being there. And we had to find a way to support ourselves. So we did what every, you know, so many foreigners who were, you know, come to Asia that, you know, want to stay for a while, we taught English. So I did that at the beginning. And then uh, in Shanghai, after a year, I had been listening to some Chinese language learning podcasts. Yeah, Bob, so, sorry, I just have to say one thing. Mormons do that too. We, oh. in places where we're not really necessarily wanted, like Russia, yeah. we get different types of visas to mask what we're doing. Totally. And, and then through, do the missionary work through the, the guise of teaching English. Yeah. And uh, it's fundamentally illegal, right? So yeah. you were kind of doing illegal activity as a Christian church, right? 
Yeah, but honestly, even worse than Mormons is that at least you guys generally have university degrees, I think. Well, journalists rarely have a university degree because we're told not to go to college. So we bought fake degrees online for a certain couple hundred dollars or whatever. And then we would use fake degrees to qualify for basically what was sort of a fake visa, um, a false premise anyway. But of course, all these things are justified because they would be like cautious as serpents, innocent as, innocent as doves, which is you know a scripture that's basically saying, you know, you can be sort of sneaky if it's furthering the kingdom interest, basically. Right. Yeah, you had a word for that at the beginning of the book. Yeah, what's it called? Theocratic, Theocratic warfare. warfare. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I know. We, yeah. call it lying. we call it lying for the Lord. That's what we call it. <laughs> That's a good one. That's okay. what it is. So you guys are in Shanghai. You're, you're there under the guise of teaching English, but you have to support yourself, right? Yeah. So what you, you you were talking about the job you got, yeah, which so I, I thought it was cool as a podcaster. I thought it was cool. Yeah, uh, well, it was the first wave of podcasting. And one of the first, the very first language learning podcast had started in Shanghai. And it was started by three foreigners. Um, and they had a small staff. And they had just started broadcasting these Chinese lessons by podcast. And they had a really friendly tone. And the hosts were entertaining of the shows. And so I, I started listening. And I loved it. And I was very interested, so I, I wrote them and said, you know, do you need anyone? Could I come work there? Um, and they did, eventually. So they hired me part-time, because I only ever worked part-time so I could preach. Um, but of course, I didn't tell them why I was really there and why I could speak Chinese. But it was a great job. I loved it. It was in this back alley, this old warehouse building, and we were making podcasts at the very beginning of podcasting. Altogether, it was before social media even, and we had these forums online, and it was just, it was a really exciting time, and especially for me because as a Jehovah's Witness, I had you know never had a career, let alone done anything creative, because we were discouraged from all of that. We were just supposed to preach, so I had had okay jobs. I mean, some Jehovah's Witnesses, a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses, just are cleaners or because they don't have an education. I had had some enjoyable jobs, part-time jobs, but this was something new altogether. It was really exciting. And was the podcast in English teaching Chinese or was it in yeah. Chinese? So it was mostly in English, but teaching English speakers Chinese. Exactly. So okay. almost all of the listeners were people from all over the world who just had an interest in China for different reasons. Maybe, you know, they had, some of them were like American born Chinese people who didn't grow up speaking Mandarin. Some of them were married to a Chinese person. Some of them were coming to China for business. There was all of these different reasons. And then tell us what the missionary work looked like um, and how you would approach people, how would you meet them, how you would kind of hook them, and then what, what their trajectory would be into membership if they ended up becoming members. Yeah, so obviously, um, as Mormons know, in China, you can't do your work openly. And so what we did was, and I'm curious to know if Mormons take the same tack, probably. Probably. Um, but anyone who's listening can tell me um, in the comments or something. But basically, we would just go there. There was uh, we, usually, you know, Joseph's life is very structured at home. There was three meetings a week, as I mentioned. We'd meet up for preaching. All of that was gone when we got to China because you couldn't do things so openly so, um, or so organized. So we were on our own a lot. From the second we got there, someone met up with us, told us how to do the work, which was basically just meet people, try to meet as many people as you can in a day, get their number if they seem friendly, and then just start getting to know them. And the idea with getting to know them was to find out whether there was anything dangerous about them. Danger would be someone who, because our work was under, was you know, restricted and illegal there, um, danger would mean they had a relative or they themselves were part of the Communist Party. Or maybe they, someone worked for the government in their family. Anyone that seemed even marginally hostile to religion or suspicious, we would just drop right away. Um, and then the others, we would slowly just cultivate them. And then one day when we felt like, okay, I think this person's okay, then we would slip in the Bible or our publications, which as I say in, in the book is an awkward proposition at the best of times. But when you're in China, it's a little weird because most people, they're not like something that's really in their periphery even. Like they kind of know about the Bible, but it's not something that comes up all the time. Right. But the interesting thing is, although that seems so 
maybe strange and jarring to just sort of slip in the Bible. It was actually very easy because especially most of the people I ended up preaching to were young people. Um, they were interested in the Bible. They were interested in Christianity because it had been something that they didn't have access to. And now China was opening up and there were these foreigners here and they wanted to know about foreign stuff. So it was actually quite easy to start Bible studies with people. And you mentioned a lovely friendship with Jean in the book yeah. uh, that I'm glad survived ultimately your disaffection. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love the part of the book where you talked about Chinese culture and how they're more comfortable talking about certain things that we're not. Do you want to talk about that really briefly? Yeah, I mean, I think this was related to the fact that I eventually started to wake up in that when you get to uh, China, China and you're a person from the West, the longer you're there and the more you understand the language, the more you understand that this place is like opposite culturally in almost every way to what you're used to. And so even like things that seem very natural or polite to you as a Westerner could be very weird and even rude to a Chinese person. So for example, like uh, from very like everyday things like in hot weather, they would drink hot water. If they saw you drinking like a drink with ice, it was like a national incident. Like people would be like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's so bad for your health. Um, uh, another scene in the book, which is funny, is when I take one of the sisters that is in China, they're now a Jehovah's Witness with me to her Bible study. And she brings her a gift of a clock, like an alarm clock. And that is like basically the worst thing you could give a Chinese person as a gift. It's so, un it's considered so unlucky, like morbidly unlucky because the word for clock, I think is shizhong. And that sh, if you say it wrong, it sounds like the word for death. And they're very suspicious about talking about death. I mean, thing that, like number four, because it also has a similar sound to the word for death. Like there's all kinds of things, all kinds of faux pas a lot of Westerners would take their chopsticks and put it in the rice when they're not eating. Like, oh, it seems like a convenient chopstick holder. Just stab your chopsticks into the rice. <laughs> like a restaurant would come to a standstill almost if someone saw you do that because it's also considered very unlucky. Um, so yeah, there, there, I learned so much. And the product of that was that I started to sort of see that there was different ways of doing things. And like, my, I had a very, obviously from being raised a witness, I had a very black and white quite rigid worldview. Everything was, you know, this or that. And suddenly there was all these like other things that I was like, whoa, it kind of blew my mind. It's so ironic that, that fundamentalist religions send their adherents on foreign missions because, you know, Mark Twain's famous as having said that the travel is fatal to prejudice. Yeah. And so it, it makes total sense that you would see this other beautiful, odd, strange, but also wonderful culture and you go into the book about learning about Confucius and learning about Lao Tzu yeah. and how you just started putting the math, doing the math and saying, now, wait a minute, how come these are good, honest, healthy people? And how yeah. come Confucius and, and Buddha and Lao Tzu are kind of saying similar things to what Jesus said? And it just makes so much sense. That I, what's, for the most part. What's that? And they came first before the, for the most part. Right. <laughs> Yeah, it makes sense that it, it could do an un, it could be the undoing of a fundamentalist religious person to be on a foreign mission. And yet that's just so classic that that fundamentalist religions send people on foreign missions. But it turns out that was the beginning of the end for you, right? Yeah, I think it's like a product of their overconfidence. You know, when you think you have the truth and I don't know, you just the hubris of just like, we're gonna go to these people and and change them all, the heathens, and like, they'll see the truth of what we're saying. So, you know, when you have that mentality, you're not thinking about your own, the weakness in your own armor. You just think you're here to bring light and truth to, you know, all these unbelievers. Um, but yeah, I wonder for Mormons, do they find that a lot of people leave when they're on their mission? Oddly, it happens sometimes. It was the beginning of my end, but it oh. still took me another 15 years or whatever to leave. But but no, the church has found that if they can get people on missions and then as soon as they get home, get them married and get them having kids, that maximizes the chance that they'll stay in the church. So it's kind of ironic. It's, it's, it's only some people that, that sort of are open to the types of thinking that you had. I have to say one of the most powerful parts of your book for me, when you're talking about 
um, the preacher and how the preacher is sure of himself or herself. The preachers yeah. are bold. Do you remember what you wrote about the preacher? Because it, it was it was in for me chapter seventeen, but your book your chapters aren't numbered, so right. I was I was listening to the audio book. But do you happen to remember what you said about the preacher? Like the, there's no person so bold as the preacher, um, because a, if you're a teach, it's something to do with like if you're a teacher, you know, you listen and you also learn. But when you're a preacher, you're not there to listen. You're there to tell and to have people listen to you. And you're so bold because you have no self-doubt. You're not even considering what anyone else might be thinking or saying. And there's such a confidence that comes with that. And also I think because you sort of like, I wasn't consciously like elevating myself, but you know, people are sitting at your feet listening or something, you know, it gives you a lot of confidence. And it's funny, I was just thinking about this the other day, but. Someone asked me on a radio show on, on NPR, I think it was, they asked me, what does it feel like to convert someone? And I said, it feels like an e winning an existential argument. It feels like it confirms that you were right. It feels like the best high there is in the world <laughs> because you took this person who had no frame of reference and you taught them something and they got them to believe it. And now you're like, See, I'm right. There's, you're on my side now. It's a very like, affirming feeling. Yeah, but, yeah. but that chapter is super powerful. That They're both bold. Preachers are both bold and blind. They yeah. don't ask questions. These are my notes. They yeah. don't ask questions of themselves. They already have all the answers, so why would they ever ask a question? Yeah. They do all of the talking and none of the asking. That's right. <laughs> uh, so powerful. So tell us about how you started losing your faith as Jehovah's Witness missionary in China. How did that happen? And of course, we're gonna be talking about Jonathan. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, there was a sort of cultural disorientation where uh, I started to see there was other ways of seeing the world. And then I think there was also a bit of a linguistic disorientation in the sense that Chinese as a language, in order to speak it as a person who has a background in English, <clears throat> and I would think any Latin-based language, you can't just translate, like when you learn Spanish, you know, you learn the vocabulary. If you have enough vocabulary, you can sort of like, just probably speak, even if you don't make complete sense, you can form sentences. But in Chinese, it is not like that. It, you cannot directly translate from English. You have to basically like reform your mind in order to speak it. You have to think in a different way. So what would happen is I think over time, I would be teaching these same materials I had taught my whole life, these same brochures, like we used them in 200 languages. So I have the same pictures, the same text sitting in front of me with them, except in Chinese characters. And I would, you know, get my student to read the paragraph as we always did when we were doing this interchange, like of a Bible study. And as I would listen to the way it sounded, and Chinese is also like a very direct language. It doesn't have a lot of articles or conjugation of verbs. It's quite straightforward because it's such an old language. And I think there was just something about hearing my beliefs in this other language. It started to, I would hear it with new ears. Like I saw it with new eyes. And there were moments where I would, I would feel embarrassed. Like, this is crazy. Like, this sounds a little crazy. And also because the people didn't even have a Christian background. Like it was something, if anyone I studied with in Canada, if that ever happened, was not often. But they had a frame of reference, like they understood the story of Adam and Eve and these types of, you know, there was this crossover culturally. Um, but in China, there was like, how do I even start? They don't even like believe in the Bible. They don't even know what the Bible is. And then here I am going into these very nuanced, crazy witness beliefs, like you can't have blood transfusions or you can only marry in the Lord. In China, there's no Jehovah's Witnesses. Who are these people going to marry? Like, all of this stuff started to just seem, or, or don't that get you a, shouldn't get an education, right? For Chinese people, that is nuts. Like, you know how hard they work to get into universities. I mean, that was crazy. So I, I started to notice, like, this, this doesn't work for everybody. Like, this might work for me, but how is this going to work for these people? You, you so, mentioned that some would view your teachings as quaint. I imagine them kind of yeah. patting, patting you on the head, viewing your teachings as yeah. quaint and silly like the yeah. one true path. And, and then you talk about the, the ethics of God choosing this very narrow religion for mostly white people, mostly in the United States, yeah. and, the, and the theological implications of the fairness of that. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, that was a big thing for me too, where 
I knew a lot of these people were not going to convert. Like I could tell they were enjoying the ride, but to actually, I was, it was far fetched. I, I, I thought it would not be a really high conversion rate. Um, so to sit there and think, okay, the reason these people aren't going to convert is because this sounds wacky to them. Like they've been raised in a completely different cultural context. Their education is completely different. They, their ancestry, like the whole cultural heritage, the way of looking at life is different. So I'm like, well, of course they're not going to be able to cross over this, this far. It's going to be hard for someone to do that. And then I started to think, well, if this really is the requirement for salvation, that you follow these beliefs and these Watchtower books to a T, um, and it's basically these people's, it's not their fault they were born in a different culture where they don't even have any frame of reference for these things. How on earth would that be fair of God? Like, so if I was born in America or Canada and I was raised around the Bible, and even if I wasn't raised a witness, it'd be like less of a far cry for me to be like, oh, maybe, you know, I can sort of change my beliefs 25%. But yeah, it, it started to occur to me that it, it was, it made no sense if you looked at it from a perspective of a God, that we believe God was fair and all loving and unbiased. I'm like, there's a lot of bias here <laughs> saying that this is what we have to follow. So well, you think about it. Preferential treatment's kind of unfair. Yeah. Think about it, like a billion people in China. How many people are in America? Like 300 million or something? Yeah. Uh, like the proportion of witnesses in America versus what would be the proportion in China. I mean, after Armageddon, they're gonna, <laughs> it's going to be very white bread. <laughs> Not to say there aren't witnesses in other countries now because they proselytize so much, but like if you're talking about Muslim country and China, that's like two billion people right there that don't even have a chance and you know to 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 be saved. Yeah, I, I had those it same questions. Make sense to me anymore. I had those same questions as a youth, but I kind of just stuffed them down. Yeah. But what about the, the the theological implications of an Armageddon where where a loving, all-powerful God is murdering everyone who doesn't follow the right, you know, choose the right religious path? Talk about that. You know, it didn't seem weird to me. <laughs> <laughs> because I think from childhood, we had these Bible story books that had pictures depicting this happening. So it was sort of like a normal event in my mind. Um, but also... Um, we always, the witnesses always use these examples from the Bible, biblical examples of where God had wiped out like big populations of people because they weren't following his word or they weren't doing the things that, you know, he commanded. So as much as it felt a little like cruel or traumatic. A like, little? <laughs> I wrote like, in my oh. notes, God as murderer is what I wrote, but yeah. go ahead. Like it's really genocide. But when you're, indoctrinated you're kind of like well we want paradise and we don't want to have crime and we don't want to have like bad stuff so they gotta go <laughs> um i love how in so many of your chapters you end with these really subtle but profound statements and at the end of what i have is chapter 18 you write curiosity is a bad quality for the preacher what if it's the preacher that needs saving you know those are my words but yeah words, that's the essence know. of it what if it's the preacher that needs saving? Yeah, it never had occurred to me, that's for sure. <laughs> so but I am a curious person, so that's maybe a problem. <laughs> so tell us about Jonathan, your undoing. Yes, uh, it was definitely like the nail in the coffin, so to speak. Um, <laughs> so I, yeah, during in the podcast role job that I had, I at the time didn't have my own podcast yet, but I was the person who, I did translating, and then I was the person who looked after the online community. And so that meant I interacted with tons of worldly people, which, you know, and not with the premise of preaching to them. It was just my job. So suddenly that was right, you know, right before social media, but the, the whole internet was like on the cusp of talking to each other. And I, it was amazing. I thought it was so fun because here I was in this community of people who were all learning Chinese and we had this thing in common and I had a lot of answers. Like I, I knew more Chinese than they did and I could answer their questions and, and tell them about things I had learned in Chinese culture. Um, and so I was sort of just, you know, primed for the first time in my life to have some relationships with worldly people, even though they were online relationships. And then in walked Jonathan, who was just like any other of the people, our customers that I would interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. But for some reason, he was very funny. I didn't know anything about him. I didn't know where he lived, but we just started talking and engaging. It was my job. I wasn't doing anything wrong. But it definitely started over weeks 
of time, it just started to become a daily thing. And I would get to work. He lived in Los Angeles. I later found out I was in Shanghai. The time zone was exactly opposite. So at the time of day when I got to work, it was the end of his work day. And we just started talking all the time. What was the age difference? Can you say that? Jonathan? Yeah. Oh, time difference? You mean? Or, age. Age. Oh, age difference. Oh, age difference. He was just a couple of years older than me. Okay. I was wondering that. I'm, I'm not sure exactly. A few yeah, years. Yeah. I'm like, as, I, as, I'm listen, as I'm reading this, I'm like, she is slipping into an emotional affair. There's just no yeah. question. And I had no idea. Like, I, for, for one thing, like, I didn't know what that looks like. Like, it just, the internet also was, it, it definitely was like, it masked it for me. Because I was like, well, I can't even see this person. And as it, you know, in this religion is obsessed with bodily pureness. Suddenly, you know, in the, if that was a man in a coffee shop, I would never have kept talking to him. But when there's no body and you're like, well, that guy is like thousands of miles away, you just kind of don't think of it. You're Nothing like, will ever happen. Yeah. And it's also like, I'm not even attracted to him. I mean, I don't even know what he looks like. It's not like a, it's not any kind of chemistry thing. It's just an intellectual dialogue, which was fun. And, and well, you must have been starving for emotional intimacy because you were in a marriage that wasn't yeah. really a, a love affair. It wasn't even yeah. a, a close friendship, it seemed. Yeah. I mean, it was sort of like a mild friendship. It was, I think what happened was, as you say, you're on this train track of a relationship together that, you know, you're doing the God's will together and that that is something in common and it can hold you together. Plus, you're not allowed to get divorced in Jehovah's Witnesses unless someone commits adultery. So you also know you have no choice. So when you get married very young and then you come to realize like, oh, like a year later, we should not be married. There's nothing you can do about it. So all you can do about it is just keep going and doing stuff in the church. So I wouldn't say we, like, we didn't have a terrible marriage. It was just not really like a marriage. It was not an intimate relationship really. Which is a terrible marriage. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, wasn't like, it wasn't like a lot of fighting and drama. It was just sort of, we're here together. Well, we can't leave, so we'll just continue on. <laughs> like that. Yeah, I mean, it, we all, marriage is always hard. Even the best of marriages yeah. are super hard. I don't mean to set people up for unreasonably high expectations, but yeah. ideally, you end up with your best friend. And ideally, yeah. you're emotionally and sexually intimate and compatible. Yeah. And you really enjoy being together. And I know you guys had a, a moderate friendship, but yeah. it's clear you were both lonely, or at least you were desperately lonely, yeah. emotionally starved, right? Definitely, yeah. Yeah. So Jonathan really, filled that. So, say, there's so many things when you're a religious person that you sort of, like, you don't acknowledge. You sort of like, I didn't, I didn't really think about that. I just sort of accepted it. Right. So how, so how did things grow with Jonathan? Oh yeah. So I don't know. We just started talking more and it was always about work stuff or Chinese or he just loved hearing all the stories because so much stuff would happen every day in China. So much crazy stuff. I mean, it's a city of 20 million people. So many fun things would happen. I would always just start sharing with him and he would come online and be like, what happened today? And something weird always happened. Um, so then it kept going and then I don't know how long it was, but slowly the conversation started to shift to more deeper topics. And one of those top topics ended up being spirituality. Um, and of course, in China, the, the government monitors the internet. So we never talked about what we did on the internet because the government could see um, if they wanted to spy on your G-chat or whatever. But I sort of told him in code, eventually we had become close enough that I kind of wanted to share. I never told anyone my secret of why I was there. And it sort of started to feel like, oh, well, here's this sort of abstract person. Um, I can finally share with him. I mean, I was sharing with him all this other stuff about my day. It's like, it, it, it got to a point where I kind of wanted to share with others, like the preaching stuff. And also, every witness kind of has this thing in the back of their mind when they make a friendship is like, oh, well, my friendship is to try and convert this person. So, you know, maybe if I talk about my religion, He'll become a witness. So, you, so and, and you use code words for religious words. Tell us what those code words were. Yeah, it was like, I don't know, just like A for Armageddon, big A for Armageddon, Jay-Z for Jesus. Um, what about so JWs? J J w we didn't say JW because that was too close. I think we just called it WIT, W-I-T or something. But when I first told him about it, I was like, he wanted to know what religion I was. And I was like, oh, like, don't even say that word. But then finally I told him, like, think of a court case witness and then he knew and then finally he reminded me i've been talking to him since the book came out 
And he reminded me, which I left out of the book, that when I told him, he said, oh, that's my fifth favorite, my fourth favorite cult. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> what was his favorite? Um, I think, well, he lives in Los Angeles, so I think it was Scientology. <laughs> I hope, Mormon, I hope Mormonism was second or third. What? Oh, he, favorite as in most hated. Because he, he just is a person who like... Yeah, but hate, let's a love-hate relationship. Let's just admit it. We all, yeah. we all love, hate our cults, right? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, the relationship tenor turns and he starts really challenging you Ooh. about, you know, you being in a cult. And I'm just thinking... Number one, I was just thinking, why didn't you just immediately run away, right? Well, how, how could you let some stranger start assaulting you about being in a cult and you keep coming back for more? What was going through your mind that lets you allow him to start the deprogramming process? Yeah, it's funny. I think, you know, um, I definitely think that I had started to enjoy the interaction. It was... I mean, it was interesting. He was interesting. He was smart. Um, and I can't remember when exactly. We started to sort of collaborate on things that were, it, it, it started to feel like an, an entanglement. And so this became one part of that. Uh, and I think that here's the thing. It's like, my, it's also a personality thing. Like some people might have been like, that jerk and like never spoken to him again. But I come from a family of people who are quite direct. And I actually prefer just knowing what, what people think. And I prefer honesty, even if I don't want to hear it, I actually would just rather know where I stand. Um, so yeah, I would, he was started to like sort of criticize or tell me things about my religion that I didn't agree with. And I would just argue, like I would say that's not true and I'd get mad. But what would happen is I would turn, like he'd go to bed and I would work and then I would just find myself thinking about this what he said you would stew yeah or like even just stew in the sense where i'd be like i can i can disprove him but you know it was getting harder and harder to refute what he was saying sometimes because it was true <laughs> i had to believe that's you know i had to believe that somewhere in your heart or in your emotions you were finding that the Jehovah's Witness lifestyle or the beliefs weren't working for you. And I'm sure it was the missionary work that kind of softened you up. But in my experience working with, uh, with Orthodox, Progressive, and then Post-Mormons, you kind of have to, your heart has to be softened. And what I mean by that is there has to be something either emotionally not working for you in the tradition or something emotionally engaging outside of it that, that makes the soil fertile for those sorts of seeds of doubt and questioning. Yeah, have you ever read that book um, by Ale Alexandra Stein? No. It's Love and Terror? No. So I found that book recently, not at the time, just recently. Um, and one thing that she says is that almost, like one of the only ways, or most effective ways anyway, for someone to get out from a cult or indoctrination like this, especially a very closed community, is to that there be an intimate relationship with someone on the outside. So sometimes for people that's like a family member, um, it could be someone from their old life before they became that that like converted to the church. Um, but interestingly, when I read that, I was like, that is why I needed Jonathan because what happens is if it's an if it's a close enough relationship, if any other person on that forum at work started saying that stuff to me point blank about my religion which people do I mean people make fun of tell Jones witnesses they're wrong all the time I could just dismiss it but when there is like an, an intimate relationship formed already it means that you uh, trust the person and so even though you might argue you're inclined to take in what they're saying even if it's on a small scale and reading that after the fact, because, you know, I did feel some shame, like, as much as, yeah, sure, there was no way to get out of a marriage unless you, like, committed adultery. I mean, I still didn't want to be that kind of person. Like, you don't sort of have an image of the kind of person that you are. But reading that was kind of a revelation, because I was like, I, I'm pretty sure that I wouldn't have been able to fully pull the trigger, even though there were other factors that kind of were making me have doubts unless I had some sort of like beacon like that on the outside that was showing me that there was some path out. 
and that I trusted. And what was ironic was that you were a missionary, but in so many ways, Jonathan was acting as a missionary to a missionary right. just for a different, uh, a different approach to life, right? Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? <laughs> I don't want to, you know, that's one of the really fun parts of the book to, to learn about what happened with Jonathan and how that relationship uh, evolved or didn't evolve or ended or didn't end. We'll, we'll let you listeners yeah, we'll know. Hold back. We'll let you we'll hold back on that. Uh, but <laughs> do you have a sense, did you ever talk to him about his motives? Because, you know, was he just, was he just really juiced about saving someone from a cult? What, or did he just develop you know feelings for you and wanted to help you like he spent a lot of time helping you he was like a missionary real service yeah. right i think like and it's funny because we're friends now and it's been you know a number of years and so i feel like i know him on a different level now because we're friends and we don't you know we still talk sometimes but now we're on more equal footing you know he's not trying to save me anymore <laughs> and i i think he has a personality in that he's um he is a very intense person. He's a person that really believes that people should have freedom of choice. It really upsets him to see people throwing away their power of reason and turning over their minds to someone else. So I think you know those things were already sort of fundamental parts of his character. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he does say at some point along the way where I'm like, why are you, why do you spend so much time like doing this? And he says, because I like you. So, you know, if you like someone, you also care about them. And so you're going to have some kind of emotional, you know, pull to help them more than maybe the average person. However, I mean, I, I don't know. I think to this day when, for example, when I had TV appearances and I was telling Jonathan about it the other day, he starts texting me and he's just like the old days. And he starts like saying, oh, you gotta tell him this, like that th these people are trading in your, um, I don't know, like they're using fear and they cage you in and like they, they use emotional blackmail. <laughs> like he's telling me all this stuff. And he kept saying, you gotta coin the term collision. Don't call it a religion. The cult was religion. So he's still very intense on these topics, even you know this many years later. Wait, he's not collusion? What is it? Collision. I was like, that's why I can't use Which it. Which is what? What are the two words? Cult plus religion. Cult, coalition. Oh my gosh. Okay. He's like, they don't deserve to be called a religion. <laughs> and I'm like, well, cult is so charged. Some people, if you're trying to get a Jehovah's Witness out, you cannot call it a cult because they will just close their mind, right? And yet he did with you and it, and it worked with you, which, you know. You know what, though? I, I honestly, like, I give him a lot of credit, but so much of my book is set in China and about China. And I have to say, he helped, but China was just a big a character in my eventual demise as Jonathan. I couldn't have left without both of them, China. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there were, there, one of the most powerful parts of the book, you asked the question, if I had been through the Cultural Revolution, and those who don't know a little bit about Chinese history won't understand, the Cultural Revolution, that sounds awesome, more culture. Yeah, what it yeah. is, is it's Mao, if I'm, if I'm right, yeah. and millions and millions of people being killed and, and, yeah. and, and imprisoned and enslaved. And yeah. you ask the question, if I had lived in the Cultural Revolution, would I have been someone what? Finish the sentence. Oh, if I would have been the per So what do I say? Um, well, there's a few things. I think I said, oh, yeah, there was the, in the Cultural Revolution that like people like were under the cult of Mao. And he, at some point, he would give these decrees. And at one point, he gave a decree that all the flowers and gardens were bourgeois, and they had to get rid of them. So people would just go and start pulling up the flowers from the flower bed, because they were too beautiful or whatever. They were making people um, soft. Or <laughs> so I was like, yeah, who would I have been? Like, I probably would have pulled up the flowers. Like, because once you're in that headspace of indoctrination, it's scary to think because where would you, where do you draw the line? And even recently, the Jehovah's Witnesses um, released a magazine and in the magazine, it said something to do with, even if at some point, the directions we give you as the governing body don't seem to make sense from a human standpoint or from human reasoning, it doesn't matter, you should still follow it. And that was the first time I'd ever seen them so blatantly come out to say directly what they always kind of danced around saying, which was, if we tell you to do something, you have to do it. 
And funnily enough, when I watched, I, I read something about in the New Yorker about the Branch Davidians. And you remember the Branch Davidians that they were in their oh, house. Yeah, David Koresh. And they, yeah. You know, the apocalypse of their own making. Um, but the Branch Davidians came from the same sort of, like when you read what his beliefs were, they were very similar to the Jehovah's Witnesses, just maybe more extreme and on a small scale. Um, so that's, that's the thing is like, if you have that mindset, suddenly what could it happen that suddenly you, the Armageddon that never comes is created? It's a question I ask because you, how long can you put it off? And that was with the Branch Davidians. He kept saying the Armageddon was coming. And then in the end, the apocalypse came, but not in the way that anyone thought. Right. You know? So I do think that that is um, a really, being in China made me see that parallel, what the ability for humans to wonderful, nice people can do terrible things. Yeah, you said it takes ideology to make wonderful people do terrible things. Yeah, it's a strange thing. And you, I mean, and, and you asked, would I have been in the, in the Cultural Revolution the person pushing others out of the building or would yeah. I have been one of the ones being pushed out of the building, right? I think about this stuff a lot. Like, what is it that makes pe some people follow the crowd and other people stand up and say, I'm not going to... I'm not going to do what's wrong. It's wrong. So yeah, it's funny when you think about morality after you leave a religion. I, it's that's one question I've thought about a lot. And to me, like one underpinning of my current morality is always like, I always want to make sure that I'm keeping my moral compass and thinking for myself that I'm not just doing what everyone else is doing. And so tell us how you tell us your process for leaving as we kind of get to the you know the end of your time as Jehovah's Witness. What was that like to have been a missionary? Uh, to have been married, to have already been through shunning once, what was it like to contemplate leaving again, this time for the final time? I mean, it, fe it felt so different this time because I had started to not believe before I even left. So it was more permanent feeling. Um, basically, this is how I sum it up, is that it was nothing heroic on my part or brave. It just got to the point where staying was more uncomfortable than leaving. And I mean, I did not want to lose my friends, much of my family. That was the last thing I would have chosen. Um, but the, the problem is, is that it re, the, the Jehovah's Witness religion requires you hand over your mind, your time, your life. And if you don't believe in it, you just can't do it anymore. And I, I do know people who can stay in and sort of fake it, but that's another thing is that my personality is just, I'm too open, as we saw, you know, as you'll find out in the book at the sort of climax when I actually leave, I probably could have kept my mouth shut and not <laughs> ended up in the position I'm in, but I just, I'm too honest, I think. And it's important to me to live an honest life. And you talk about, you, one of those really short chapters, you mention what you lost and what you've gained. Um, can I read that? Or do you want to read it on page 213? Do you want to read it? Why don't you read it? Sure. 213? This is, yeah, the, to oh, yeah. Call. this is page 213 of Leaving the Witness by right. Amber Scora. It is. Things I had lost, things I still had. Oh, yeah. I, I had exited without an exit plan. I was an ex-preacher stuck in China with no education beyond high school, no profession, no home to go back to in my home country. I took stock of things, things I had lost family members, all my friends, my future, my past, my life with my friends and family in it, my faith, my certainty, my hope, my purpose in life. And then you look at the things I have and it's, <laughs> it ain't pretty. <laughs> it's like two pots, some books, a hockey bag, a hockey bag suitcase, a bicycle. <laughs> So my Kia towels, and then you write my health. Um, I mean, if only we could look back, you know, years later, and I, I feel like it was a really special time. It was an amazing time in my life. It was a great country to be in, but I, it was traumatic. Like, I did not know how I was going to get out of China. I didn't know where I was going to live. I didn't know how I was going to earn a living. I didn't know any people. <laughs> I didn't have a relationship. So... It was definitely a stressful, scary time. So we'll leave, we'll leave the final plot points to people to actually read the book, because this is a phenomenal book. Everyone should read it. Again, Leaving the Witness, Exiting Religion and Finding a Life. In our final moments together, 
Amber Scora. Um, so what, what has been the reaction to this book by the people in it and by your family and friends who you knew during the time? Have you been hated? Have you been celebrated? It's so funny because I was just thinking this morning, I'm, I'm still in the honeymoon period between the book having just come out and all the people who ordered it or heard about it who are reading it. And it's, it's, most people say they can read it in a couple of days um, or you can listen to the audiobook in just six hours or whatever it is. Um, so I've got all these people who are interested and a lot of ex-members who have read it and they're just so happy and they feel like they, someone has a voice and has put voice to the things that they you know, feel and sent me a lot of very encouraging kind words. Um, but I'm in that honeymoon period because I think the ripples of like the press and everything haven't reached the ex, I mean, sorry, the actual Jehovah's community. So I'm expecting the onslaught because I mean, you know, it's, you know, it's coming. There's, people do not like it when you leave and talk about it. I'm sure as a Mormon, it's the same, but for Jehovah's Witnesses, it's also particularly rare. Like there's not that many people who have really openly written about it an experience like this, someone who was sort of like, you know, very into the church for like a long time and gone to the, the point of being a missionary. Like they, they feel it's a real betrayal and I'm sure that happens in your community too. And they don't understand when, when you're indoctrinated, you don't understand why anyone would tell the story. They think you have some nefarious motive. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to understand until you get out how important it is to tell these stories. <laughs> and so you haven't received the super negative mean reactions yet? No, not yet, um, which has been surprising, but I, I'm, I'm expecting it. In fact, maybe I'll check my email right now. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, to be honest, and you were on like The Daily Show just two days ago, most Mormons don't read these books. Like you mentioned yeah. a book, a memoir that was written. They won't read it. They won't know about it. They won't even know that it came out because awesome. that's part of that bite methodology. Have you met Stephen Hassan yet? Yeah. Have you learned about his work? Yeah. Behavior, they control behavior, information, thoughts, and they manipulate you through emotions. Yeah. The stranglehold of information yeah. on members in high demand religions is kind yeah. of profound. It is. And you, as I say, even when it came to sin or anything, you police yourself. I did it. I would never have read it. I'm sure some people will sneakily read it, but even the very fact of its existence, you know, will make them upset, even if they don't read the content. Because I don't think the content is particularly, I tried to be fair. I tried to be not, you know, like ranting and raving. I tried to be balanced about the way I presented things. But they'll just, just the fact of it, that it's here in the physical form. And also, you know, it's been in mainstream media. And that, that is media that Joe Witnesses listen to, like the radio. <laughs> so, um, yeah. But yeah, if any of them are watching, I encourage you just to read it because I think it's just, it's, it's presented not as some sort of like apostate book trying to ruin your faith. It's just basically a story that kind of reveals things along the way that, you know, might make a person think. And so who were you? It's hard to write a book, right? How long did it take you to write this? It took me two years and a bit, um, but I had a day job at the time. So the, I was writing at night and I had a, yeah, I was... I had written a couple of chapters earlier just myself, so those are in there too. But I would say all in all, it's like two years. That's a big commitment. And what, what was your intent in writing it? Who were you trying to help? Did you have a primary, secondary, tertiary audience? Well, the funny thing is, is that I actually just tried not to think about the audience when I was writing it because I didn't want... There is, of course, some residual, I still care about people that were used to be my friends, even though they don't talk to me anymore. And I knew that if I thought about that, it would prevent me from being as truthful as I needed to be. So I never really wrote it with the intent of like, I want to like get to expose Jehovah's Witnesses or I want to make my friends see the light. I think that in the end, the book could do all of those things if it reached the right people. But I didn't think about it at the time. I just felt like I needed to write a truth, my truthful experience. And that was as far as I would allow myself to sort of thing. And then the funny thing is, is that the day I finished and like, you know, I handed it off to the editor, it was done. It came back in like proofread form. And then when I saw it, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> then you're like, even my boss is going to read this. Like everybody's going to read it. It's, but I think when you're writing a memoir, you have to detach yourself from that. Otherwise you're going to be hiding things. And like, I, I don't feel like I spared myself in this book. I tried to be, 
you know, honest about the things I did as well. And I, I didn't want to sort of like sugarcoat my own behavior. For those, it's super brutal to get a book contract with a top, you know, publishing house. For those who would want to write their own memoir and have a shot at this level of uh, exposure, any tips you want to give people of how you made that happen? Because that's probably yeah, not easy. You know, yeah, I live in New York, so that helps because this is the land of publishing. But one of the, the thing that actually got me my very first agent meeting was that I wrote a piece that got published in a magazine called The Believer. It's not even a very well-known magazine, but that piece, taught, it was like a very short, abridged essay about my story. And if you get published, just, it doesn't have to be, you know, 2,000 words, 3,000 words, it doesn't have to be huge. But if you get a piece published and it's well-written and it's engaging, it definitely helps as a way, as a path forward to getting a meeting with an agent. The other thing to know is that you don't have to write the whole memoir. Publishers don't want the whole book when they're shopping, when you're shopping it around, they want a proposal. So having a very good master plan is more important than writing the whole book. So that's really important too. So had you, were some of the chapters in this book part of your proposal? Yeah, you have to submit usually two sample chapters. One of mine got thrown out. The editor didn't want it. And <laughs> it, was a chapter, it was a chapter on, I had toured the Jehovah's Witness Bethel in Brooklyn as a member back, you know, many, many years ago. And then when I lived in New York, after leaving the religion, I went back and toured it again, sort of undercover. So it was a chapter like that, but it didn't really fit into the narrative of my book. But what it does essentially is show them that you can write. Um, and you know, even if you're writing your own piece, um, it's always good to have someone else look at it as an editor because more eyes on the thing always makes it better. So that's my other writing advice. Every, every writer needs an editor. Yeah, for sure. Do you have plans? What are your plans going forward related to this book and you being now a prominent ex Jehovah's Witness? Do, do you have, do you want to be an activist? Do you want to save other people from cults? Do you want to move on and just write about other things and leave all this behind? How, how do you think about your future now? It's funny because before I wrote the book, I always felt like I was trying to outrun my past. Like I didn't have a degree. I'm still trying to finish my degree because I've been working and had a child, had children. <laughs> um, but when I wrote this book, finally, I feel like I just owned it. Like I owned my past and it felt really good because it felt like it stitched together the past with the present in this way that now it didn't feel like the time before was wasted where I used to feel like oh, I wasted all this time in this cult. But now it suddenly feels like, oh no, this is like part of my identity. So I have a few ideas. I have another book idea that I might try. Um, I also am taking a lot of classes, religion classes right now. So I'm planning to finish my degree in religion and then maybe go on to get a master's. And I was considering doing something like you, you know, sort of counseling, not you do, <laughs> not like a activist in this sense, but I was thinking of becoming a therapist to try and help people to get out. Um, because I think it is a way of, sort of knitting together your own storyline. And I can't help it. I still have that preacher's impulse, I think, to help people. It's, it's nice to help people. So maybe something like that. Um, uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. There's a, I just have to tell you, one of the things I'm most proud about in Mormonism is this uber, post-Mormonism, is this uber robust Mormon community of, of progressive and post-Mormon themed podcasts, of progressive and post-Mormon Facebook groups, of of a really robust ex-Mormon Reddit page with over 100,000 members. Uh, we're starting to have uh, workshops and retreats and even conferences for uh, healing and growing after, after Mormonism. Okay. And I just, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an area, I, I just wanna just throw my two cents in. That's it, you know, I wondered about whether you would ever wanna start an ex-Jehovah's Witness podcast um, I, I told uh, Tova Mervis the same thing. There needs to be an ex-Orthodox podcast. Yeah. The Mormon Stories model has really worked of just having people tell their stories about yeah. having been Mormon and now how they left Mormonism and then how they yeah. built a life afterwards. So yeah. I just want to give you my two cents, man. <laughs> it, oh, it's like an idea. <laughs> podcast, uh, yeah. be a, a therapist, a coach. Yeah. There's so much need out there. And I just want to personally thank you, Amber Scora, because sometimes people in one faith tradition need the experience of someone in a totally different faith tradition yeah. to kind of wake up and Mormons oh, totally. are Mormons and post Mormons are going to see themselves 
a thousand different times and a thousand different ways in this amazing book. Uh, the book is Leaving the Witness, Exiting a Religion and Finding a Life. One last thing, I'm going to ask you one last question. It's going to be a little bit hard. Yeah. The last chapter of your book, you talk about uh, ending up finding a partner, having a baby, and then losing the baby. Yeah. It's a sober topic, but you know, when people are rebuilding a life and, and, and without religion, and then you're confronted with the sort of tragedy that, that is what creates religion in the first place, the certainty, yeah. the yeah. comfort, the theology about an afterlife, how did you and do you cope with sort of some of those real life hard tragedies without a religious framework? And maybe we can use that as a way to just sort of final thoughts for our listeners as they're trying to pick up their lives and rebuild and they'll face tragedy too. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like when I left the religion, I, I kind of felt like, oh God, all, all that bad stuff's behind me and like everything's going to be okay now. So when that happened, after I finally felt like I was on my feet again, um, it was really hard to deal with. It was hard to accept. And I will say this, anyone who has lost a child, religious or not, it is very difficult thing to cope with. Um, I think a lot of what helps people who are religious cope with death is the community of the religion. And I will say this is that when I was a Jehovah's Witness, I thought that that was like the trademark of being a Jehovah's Witness, that you had all this loving community. And I was led to believe that that only existed in the Jehovah's Witnesses. But outside, it was even more. <laughs> there was so much love shown to my family. And that's only what gets people through this kind of tragedy is other people. There were people who, strangers who had also lost children who contacted me. There was a therapist who helped me, which was very important. Um, and just the love that people showed. So there's like that. I think that that's like religion, a big part of religion is that community. And that's a big part of what helps people through. Then there's of course the imagined future that you're going to see that person again. And that for me is very difficult because obviously the thing I want most in life is to see my child again. But the reality is, is that I can't manufacture that belief now that it's gone. And I'm not going to trade it in for something else because it. I just have a fundamentally different sense of life and God and reality now than I did as a religious person. Um, so I just have to find ways to cope. And one of the ways I did that was by being in the real world. For example, after my son died, I started a campaign for parental leave because he was a small child and he died on his first day in childcare. So in, as a Jehovah's Witness, we're not allowed to get involved in politics, trying to make the world better. That's God's department. But now here I have this opportunity to you know, keep my son in the world by trying to change the policies around parental leave in this country, which are dismal. So there was, there's that. And that surprisingly was a very healing thing because the one thing that a parent that loses a child fears most is that their child will be forgotten and like their life doesn't matter because it was short. And so to this day, if you ask, like I could meet people all around New York at least, and maybe other parts of the country, if they know the story of my son, Carl is his name. And a lot of people actually know his name and they know the story. So there's that. I think there's things you can just do in the present. And then the other side of it is just trying to exactly that. I'm not trading in a future of some fantasy future that I had, you know, that I'll see him again. I have to live in the now and just by appreciating life. Because one thing that losing a child teaches you is that life is very short and it is very fragile and nothing is guaranteed. So although it is still very painful, it is painful every day to not have my child, but um, I do just try to move forward. And I also have a daughter now, which definitely helps <laughs> as well. So yeah, I mean, there's no answer. There's gonna be pain in life. I mean, I think religion can numb some of that pain, but religion also brings different pain with it sometimes, especially more culty religions. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Like, th there's no way to escape death. And so we have to just live with it. And that's what I have to do. You also write about pain making you a more compassionate person, yeah. a deeper person, and a more grateful person. That's true, yeah. And that's something that if it's numbed, then you don't get that development, right? That's very true, yeah. Yeah. Uh, where ha last question, where have you landed on kind of God and Jesus and, and the afterlife? Or have you even landed anywhere? You know, what I, you know what I believe in now? I believe in 
magic. <laughs> like for me, I can't not, I, like I wrote a recent article in the New York Times actually about grieving without religion. And a lot of people interpreted what I said to mean that I was an atheist, but I'm not an atheist. I just don't believe that we know, and I don't think there's any evidence of life after death. So I don't believe in life after death until someone tells me something, something gets proven different. But I do believe that there is some creative force. There's no way to me that the, everything can be so magical and beautiful for no reason. I don't know. And also just having like seen a child grow inside of my <laughs> womb and like how the miracle, the miraculousness of life when you give birth to a child, it's, it's impossible for me to believe it's completely random, but I don't think there's like an interested God figure sitting up in heaven looking down on us. And I don't believe that the God that, you know, we worship from the Bible is an actual representation of actual God. I think it's a human constructed, you know, as, as you will learn in a sociology class, socially constructed God. <laughs> I think people create God because they need that, but it's not the, the kind of God that's been created in mainstream religions is sort of, I'm sort of, yeah, I'm kind of over that. I don't, I don't really think that that's true. And the afterlife is just a question mark for you? Yeah. I, I think we'll know when it, if it happens. <laughs> and are you okay with that uncertainty? That no. seems to be the theme of the book is that certainty is the, is the villain. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I'm okay with it because I have to be, I, I wish, I wish that I could live forever in paradise on earth, but you know, I don't think that's happening. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to die. I don't think most people want to die. Um, I would love to live on forever, but uh, I also don't want to live my life for something that's not true. I don't want to pin everything because it changes how you live life. So yeah. I'm basically at the point where I'm like, I, I take what's in front of us as reality. Yeah, well, beautiful. Well, Amber Score, I could have had you on for five, Thank 10 you. hours easily. Thanks for uh, having me. What's that? Thanks for having me. It was great talking to you. We're so grateful for your time. And we're so grateful for this book, Leaving the Witness, Exiting a Religion and Finding a Life. Amber Scora is the author. You are a gift to us all. We wish you uh, fortune and success and popularity <laughs> beyond your wildest dreams. Please don't forget about us. If you ever want to come to Salt Lake City, oh, I, love I will you. personally help bring you here. Uh, I mean that. I've done it several times and I'll do it again. So thank you for sharing your story with us. Not just Mormon stories, but with the world. And please stay in touch. Yes. And, and we wish you so much success. In yeah, and also, I would love for your listeners, if they want to talk, like, have, dis, like, engage in discussion, I'm online, just my name, I'm the only Amber Score in the world, so I'm easy to find, but I love talking about this stuff. Yeah. How do they reach you? What are the ways? I'm on Twitter, Amber Scora. I'm on Facebook. All you got to do is, I have a website. Everything's under my name. So you have an email address? It. Yeah. What is it? It's amber.scora at gmail. Just and Scora is S-C-O-R-A-H for yeah. those listening and not uh, viewing. But you can also find it on my website if that was too quick. Yeah, Tova Mervis said, <laughs> Tova Mervis says that the reaction to, oh, what's the website? Amber, Amberscora.com? Amberscora.com, yeah. Okay, beautiful. Tova actually has told several people that, and again, ex-Orthodox Jew, that her engagement with Mormonism, Mormons, ex-Mormons and liberal Mormons has been the most meaningful part of her memoir. Yeah, so, I'm, I would love to know more. So, so listeners, progressive and post-Mormons, let's make uh, Amber Score's engagement with, with post-Mormons the best part of her memoir experience <laughs> as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope you guys Please like the book. <laughs> all right, Amber, you take care. Thank you so much. Uh, have a great day. And thanks to all our listeners for joining us today on Mormon Stories. Mormon stories at gmail.com. If you want to email us, uh, please donate at uh, mormonstories.org. 10, 15, 20, 100 bucks a month, whatever you can afford, keeps this nonprofit alive and allows us to keep bringing you stories like this. If you want to bring Amber to Salt Lake City, reach out. We'll, uh, we'll fund a trip and we'll schedule it and we'll bring her out and we'll get some more time with Amber like we did with uh, Tova and with uh, Tara Westover. So, uh, Please reach out. Please support us on Mormon Stories. Take care, everybody. And uh, we'll see you soon, Amber. Bye. Take care.